Hard disks also contain a cache. That's a little piece of volatile main memory. And we have to be aware of that because it has effects on how we read data from the device and how we write data to the device. So what this cache does, and, and typically it's in the order of 128 megabytes, and, the, and you will also find that in flash drives and SSD devices. But let's look at hard disks. So what happens is for read requests, the controller, the hard disk controller tries to cache accesses. So if you're accessing a particular block on the hard disk, say block number one, yeah, and then maybe you're accessing it for the first time, so the hard disk actually has to read it from the platters and returns it, but also caches it in the disk cache if there's space available and if the replacement policies of the disk cache make the decision to cache it. So if later on maybe you are requesting the same block again from the hard disk, it might happen that the hard disk controller is able to serve that request from the disk cache directly. So without going to the actual platters and that of course will be much faster. So while accessing it the first time, it might also be placed in the disk cache. And then when the second request comes in, you're serving that request from the disk cache directly. So that helps in many situations to have a faster read access for the device. But again, it also requires a hard disk to implement some caching logic as on any other level of the storage hierarchy. One of the most important effects is that usually the controller tries to read the entire track into the cache. So once you have the disk head positioned on a specific track, you don't wait till the sector you're interested in becomes available under the head but you immediately start reading and read all the sectors, assuming that those sectors eventually are requested anyway by the operating system. So read requests may be served by the hard disk cache. Another thing that's more important to keep in mind for databases, that's not only performance of the device, but also consistency of the database system, that's write caching. So what may happen is that you write something to the device so let's say again you write the block number B1 and the hard disk tells you immediately, hey, everything fine, I wrote it. But what might actually happen is that the hard disk doesn't put it on the platters, but only keeps it in the disk cache and writes it later. So actually your write request made the hard disk store it in its disk cache, but the hard disk maybe hasn't written it yet to the actual platters. So this may lead to the following situation. Assume there's a power failure. Assume anything goes wrong in the computer system. Maybe it's just you're switching off the machine. Then as this memory is volatile, this block may not be written to the platters at all. So if there's a power failure, you may end up in a situation where this data is lost, never written to the hard disk. And then if you switch on the machine again, you won't be able to recover that data anymore. So that may be pretty bad. So this write caching has this positive effect, of course, that writing to the disk cache is way faster than writing it directly to the platters. So the software runs faster, hopefully. However, if you assume that once a hard disk tells you, yeah, I've written that, if you then assume that it was actually written to the platters, however, it was only stored in the disk cache and not put on the platters, you might destroy the consistency of your database. You might lose important data. So this is very important to keep in mind. So there are two things to fix that. So some devices actually have a little battery um, that allows the disk to write down the contents of its cache if there is a power failure. That's one possible solution. The other possible solution is if the software really requires to write the data to the platters and not only to the disk cache, there are different flush commands that you can issue and then the contents of the disk cache are flushed to the platter. And only once that was successfully done, the hard disk will return the command, the flush command will return and then you can be sure that the data made its way to one of the platters. So that's very important to keep that in mind. So bottom line, this is good for asynchronous writes, but be careful with consistency. 
So we learned about two different things already. The this controller is doing. The first is all this mapping, mapping logical block numbers to physical positions on the drive. The second is caching, be it read or write caching. And the third is reordering of requests. So this is the elevator optimization. So what the, uh, the hard disk controller does here is uh, it reorders the incoming requests. And if you go really back to a building, assume we have a building with different stories or floors. Yeah? So let's say we have four floors. And then you have people calling the elevator, pressing the button at the elevator to make the elevator move to their floor. So assume the elevator is here. Let's assume this is the elevator. Okay, and now someone is pressing here the button and then someone is pressing here the button. So in this situation, the elevator won't move first to floor four and then to floor three. It will first stop at floor three, basically. It will move here, then it will go there. And then whatever the requests are, it will move down again. So basically, an elevator makes this up and down movement basically to a large subset of the floors. It goes up and down, and this means that the requests are reordered. And this has the effect that, in total, the throughput of people in the elevator, using the elevator is increased. And the disk arm does the same thing. So it doesn't blindly go to the positions requested by the operating system or by the database, but it rather does a movement like that. So it reorders the requests and then tries to do a movement more like that. With that, the throughput of the device is increased. And that is called the elevator optimization. If you liked this video, don't forget to hit the like button. Thank you. So if you want to see more database videos, be it in English or in German, take a look at my website datenbankenlernen.de. It has a couple of English and German videos. You can also subscribe to my YouTube channel Jens Did, or you look at our website infosys.uni-saarland.de. See you there.